Tesla. <laughs> That's a significant library behind you, sir. <laughs> I got about 70,000 songs, music. Wow. Hey, Ty, you should see my son. I have a son in Burien, and he's got an entire room like that, but with like three walls, plus my mother's Steinway piano. Then upstairs in his office, he's got a huge room with all books. He's He's never, he was never the, um, when I go to his room when he was a kid, I used to say, Andrew, if you don't clean up, I'm going to get a big trash bag. But his books and his music are, you know, perfect. Got, <laughs> got everything all, you know, categorized. Um, but anything other than books and music, forget it. <laughs> when I moved to Alaska, I, I, I took all the CDs and basically put them in these binders. Wow. Uh, but I didn't throw away, unlike some of my friends, I didn't throw away the boxes. I just boxed them up and put them in my mom's attic. So when I moved to Washington, I reunited, I brought, I hauled all the, the CD cases back and reunited them and created this wall and put them back into one big happy family again. Uh, you would love my son's room. <laughs> his wife, and luckily his wife loves all the music too, so. It's funny, mine all fit on here. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so I think we have a quorum and it's 10 o'clock. So if everybody's okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Debbie, are you ready? Ready. Okay, okay. Great, so I'm gonna call to order the September 9th meeting of the Olympic Region Clean Air Agency. Uh, this is Jim Cooper, chair. Let's go ahead and go around and do introductions uh, so that we have them for the minute. Uh, Cynthia, you wanna kick it off? Sure, I'm Cynthia Pratt. Um... Deputy Mayor of the City of Lacey and Vice Chair of Orca. Joan? Oh, I can't hear you, Joan. You're on mute. Joan Cathy, City of Tumwater. Great. Greg? Greg Brotherton, Jefferson County Commissioner. And I, I heard the other day that the, the most used phrase in the last six months is, I think you're on mute. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Or can you hear me? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Ty? Ty Mincer, uh, Thurston County Commissioner. There's Tim Kreuss. And Tim. Uh, Tim Kreuss, uh, Department of Community Development for Pacific County. Welcome, Tim. Sorry, I didn't have a video for you, so it dropped off. I can see you now, though. So. Um, okay, Fran, uh, why don't you kick off the staff and uh, folks can just chime in right after you. Fran McNair, Executive Director. Odell? Odell, you're on mute. Okay. Yeah, I know. I hadn't said anything. Uh, Odell Hadley, Senior Air Monitoring Person. Mike? <laughs> I'm Mike Schultz. I'm uh, here for compliance, filling in for Robert, who couldn't be here. Dan? Uh, Dan Nelson, Public Information Officer. Debbie Moody, everything else. <laughs> Mark Gooden, engineer. Lynn Harding, admin services manager. I think that's that's us for staff. That's everyone. Okay, is there any public on the line? It says no callers on that line, so I'm assuming that's the helpful thing for me. So thank you. 
Okay, so uh, is everyone okay with the agenda as presented? Okay, I'm seeing nods from everyone. Uh, Tim, you're okay with it? Yes, I'm okay. Okay, and I see our council, Jeff Myers, logging in. Welcome, Jeff. Morning, Jim. Okay, so we have an agenda, uh, and that takes us to the chair report. I don't have anything. Fran, is there anything I should have? Oh, um, we won't meet in November, so I want to make sure folks that have that on their on their radar uh, because it's Veterans Day. So we will this year we will have a December meeting and not a November meeting. That's correct. Okay. Anything else I should be mentioning now, Fran? Nope. Okay. Think of. Great. Great. So that takes us to public comment. We have none. It appears there's still no public on the line. Let me just check. Anyone from the public that'd like to speak? Okay, that takes us to our consent agenda. Uh, is there a motion for approval of the consent agenda? Cynthia Pratt, I move that we um, uh, approve the consent agenda. Second. Greg. Okay, it's moved and seconded. Any questions, comments, or polls? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Okay, so that takes us to the unfinished business of the personnel policy on furloughs uh, and reduction in force. Fran? Yes, so at the, this is September, at the August board meeting, uh, we presented uh, the changes that would include the reduction in force options, um, furlough is one of them. Um, and so based upon your comments um, that had come in prior, um, you, in your packet you have a draft, you've got the, the the version that's redlined. Um, with, with, so what we did was we took all the changes with reduction in force and moved it into the PMP manual, the personnel policy manual. We had to move some things around just to make it more consistent. So you'll see some changes that were, were not new language, but just better format. Um, so you have the draft before you and um, what we need is um, a motion to approve, if you so approve, um, the new additions to the PMP manual. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Questions? We've been through this a couple times, and so is every, if everyone's feeling okay with it, I'll, I'm open to a motion. Oh, let's wait a second. Mary Ellen's joining us. That way she can be a part of this action. Yes. See if that pops in really quick here. Give her a second. Okay, well, it's it's not coming in right away, so let's go ahead and keep moving forward. Uh, so, is there a motion to approve the uh, amended personnel policies as presented? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carries. Okay, Fran, you have updated personnel policies with the section we hope not to use. I was to say at this point, we don't look like, it doesn't look like we'll be using it. So thank you, we Good. have it there just in case, um, but we hope we never have to use that. Thank you very much. Great. Okay, so that takes us to new business. Uh, looks like some RCW numbering changes. I'll pause there and say, welcome Mary Ellen. I think you can hear us now. Mary Ellen, are you there? Maybe she's still struggling with audio. It's, it looks like it's connected. Okay. So uh, Fran, are you covering this one? Yes, I am. Okay. So um, in the 2020 legislative session, the legislature um, passed um, a le legislation because 7094 was getting pretty cumbersome. Um, and so they reformatted 7094 into RCW 70A.15 and then there's three digits to go after it. We had hoped that the three digits that would follow the 15 would be the same digits that were in 7094, but they're not. <laughs> the topics haven't changed, but um, the numbering is completely changed. And we actually have until I think July of 2025 to make the change, but it's, it's cumbersome. And so we're asking um, what we want to do is it's, it's obviously we have to go through our entire rules and regulations um, to make the changes because it affects everything. 
um, and we then would have to send it to the code revisor. Um, here's Mary Ellen. Hi, Mary Ellen. Hi, Mary Ellen. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like we have Randy too now. Uh, there's hi, Randy, and he's still connecting to our audience. Want me to wait a minute? Okay. Yeah, Randy, there. are you there, Randy? Uh, okay. Um, in any case, so you know, we what I need. So we need to do renumbering um, because of the length of our, our, you know, of the document. We it wouldn't come back, and it's not a big deal. But it won't wouldn't come back to the board um, with with the CR 102 um, for a motion until December because it takes that long. It's all based on number of pages, and so what we're going to do is we have to go through our entire rules and regulation and substitute in the new numbering system for the old numbering system. And the reason I want to get it done is. If you go to the RCWs now and you put in 7094, you can get to the new numbering system, but it's cumbersome. And so the, they've already updated the RCWs with the new 70, 70 um, A.15 and then the three digits. Um, so all I want to do is there'll be no changes in content. It's just strictly numbering. And what I'd like to ask you to do is, is if you would um, have a motion today to allow me to go ahead and submit the CR 102 and then in December, we'd have our public hearing and we could pass it um, so that as of January, our numbering system and our rules would be consistent with the numbering system in the RCW. So it's really just paperwork. Okay, uh, let me pause and say welcome Randy and Mary Ellen. Randy, can you hear us? He's, got He's muted. There you go. Mary Ellen's muted too. <laughs> and I also I also have a question who the three six zero four nine zero seven three eight nine phone number is. Uh, I have no idea. Unidentified it says. I'll need them to identify them for the record. Whoever it is, you're on mute. Can you unmute yourself? I wonder if Nick can. What's the number, Rachel? Three six zero. I can't. It's a Shelton number. I can't. Yeah. Three six zero. Four nine zero seven three eight nine. I don't have my glass on, but I can see it. Here we go. Oh. Lynn's are they be... unmuted? No. Oh, who? So who? Who are you with this phone number? Can you hear me? That was Randy Neville on that line too. I, that's how I had to get oh, in. Oh, it's first Randy. Time. Okay, thank you. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's what I was saying. I was on earlier. I just couldn't talk or anything, but oh, I got okay. all handled. All right, that. welcome, Randy. <laughs> Great. So IT will rename you, and then we'll know who you are. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. So. Um, Fran is asking for a motion to direct staff to file the CR 102 to update our RCW numbers throughout our policies. Uh, does anybody have any questions or is there a motion? Greg? Moved. It's moved. I second it. It's been moved and double seconded. Is there any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Okay, so we'll look for that in December. Thank you, Fran. And then uh, it looks like now we'll go to our compliance program update. And I think that is that Mike today? Yes, Mike Schultz. Yes, it is. Um, all right. Well, like I said, I'm filling in for Robert. Um, he couldn't be here. Um, not a lot. Uh, we continue to um, do uh, inspections the best we can with the COVID issue, basically staying away from some of the more uh, hot spots, such as inspecting hospitals, uh, correctional facilities, places like that. Um, but aside from those, we're still getting a lot of inspections done, a lot of outside uh, summertime inspections. Um, our actual number of complaints that we're responding to are starting to be down a little bit. And we typically expect that during the summer months because of the um, burn bans that are in place. Um, we continue to several counties even become more restrictive with burning, um, at least for the next few weeks. Um, so our complaints are, are down a little bit. Our inspections are still happening. Um, uh, asbestos, is, asbestos and demo seem to be ticking right along. So I think there's a lot of people doing some work at home or building or what have you, remodeling. 
Uh, other than that, uh, any other questions based on the um, the report that you guys got from Debbie, the compliance packet? Uh, Mike, I got a question about Elma Grocery and, and, and gas. Yes. Car wash. Um, uh, what's the violation there, and is that a repeat violation? Elma Grocery and Gas. The violation there, give me a second to that's check that one out. Darletta's, uh, and it's a... That's uh, an old one. That's been paid. Yeah, that one's already been resolved. Okay, that's the one that was resolved in the PCHB appeal. Yeah, she was making payments, and it just yes. finished up, so that's okay, why. That's why that, yeah. I, I, I was just wondering if we had a new one with Darletta. Yeah, yeah. no, no, that was, you know, that was finally... Yeah, concluded. She got everything paid up uh, this last month of August. Excellent. Any other questions for Mike? Good job. Okay, thank you, Mike. You're we'll welcome. let you off easy today. Yeah, shoot, I was prepared <laughs> for more, but that's good. We can stop right there. Thank you. <laughs> okay, we'll go to Mark with engineering. Hey, good morning, and uh, let me know if you can't hear me. <clears throat> We're going to go over real quick the, uh, the list of industrial and commercial air permits that we've been working on and that are in the permit pipeline, so to speak. On page one, I'd just like to point out several noteworthy ones. One on, on page one, Fox Lumber. Uh, <clears throat> this was for installation of a bag house at an existing wood products facility in Montesano. And I just wanted to say that, uh, that this was a long time coming. Uh, it, it involved permitting and compliance enforcement. Uh, Mike has spent a lot of time on, on this particular case. And our engineer, Lauren Weibrew, uh, wrote the permit. And so I'm really happy that this one finally got resolved and you could see um, that uh, it's, it's complete there, it's showing up on page one, and we sent the final permit out. Um, <clears throat> Question. Yes. Um, when you say um, a bag house, is that, what exactly is that? I mean, in a few sentences, it's, you don't need to go into engineering yeah, thoughts. It's, but. Simple. it's a big structure. With, it's like a giant vacuum cleaner, except it's got more capacity. It, and it's essentially fabric bags within a big structure. You send a lot of air through it. It's dirty. It filters out the, the particulate. And uh, then there's a mechanism to shake the bags or get the particulate off the bags. And you, you take that the particulate and you dispose of it in, in a responsible fashion. In the case of Fox Lumber, they had dust issues from us. They had a cyclone, um, several cyclones and several really dusty uh, air emission points that they needed to put this bag house on. And, and so this was kind of a, a group effort. I think it, uh, everybody just about here was involved and they finally, Fox Lumber finally did the right thing and they they're installing this bag house. I'm just pointing this out because it, it's it's been on the list for quite some time. You may have noticed it being on the list here for quite some time. So it's resolved. Thank you. Um, the other one on page one as well is Panel Tech and Jennifer DeMay. Uh, she's the engineer that worked on this one. And this is a, a, a specialty panel producing facility in um, at the at the Port of Grace Harbor. They uh, they use chemicals to saturate special papers that they that they uh, put on wood panels and press for things for products that are used like in, in uh, concrete forms when they're doing concrete work. They have special panels that uh, allow them to do the concrete work and the panels don't stick to the concrete after, afterwards. Um, but they, they do a variety of products there and I'm just pointing this one out because it's, uh, it's, it's a uh, chemical 
manufacturing, uh, a chemical, uh, a manufacturing company located in Grays Harbor that uses a lot of chemicals, and you wouldn't know it's there. Um, it, it's pretty pretty nondescript. You don't see anything coming out of their, their uh, stacks and vents, but they're doing a lot of work there, and they do emit a lot of air pollution, and uh, they show up on, on this list here quite often because they're always making various changes and upgrading the facility. Uh, so I'll, I'll leave it at that, and if you see any of these that are in your neck of the woods and you want, want more information on, uh, please call or email and, and I'll get you that information. <clears throat> the, uh, the last thing I'd like to talk about, if Fran ask, actually asked me to uh, talk a little bit about biomass, uh, biochar production. And uh, I'll give a real quick overview and then ask questions because I'm not really sure what, what uh, initiated the, the ask here. Uh, first, uh, how is biochar? So biochar is essentially the uh, is essentially carbon that's left over from decomposing biomass like wood, straw, grass, and it's uh, it's made in a in a uh, process referred to as pyrolysis which is thermal decomposition at an elevated temperature of, of uh, biomass. And it's done in a starved air environment. Uh, and the byproducts are biochar, essentially it looks like charcoal. It's black, it's, it's, it's almost pure carbon. So that's one of the byproducts. And the other byproducts are volatile gases or pyrolysis gases. Okay, so unlike combustion, like if you're taking if you're taking wood and you're going to combust it in air, uh, <clears throat> you're left over with ash. In pyrolysis, if you do it right, your left your leftovers are uh, biochar, and you produce these volatile gases that can be burned. So the essential things to know here for, for biochar production are it's a thermal decomposition of wood. It's done at elevated temperatures and it's done in a what's referred to as a starved air environment. So you, you want to starve the oxygen so that carbon does not burn. Okay. Um, you need a heat source because uh, you need temperatures around 600 to 1200 Fahrenheit. And that heat source can be the byproducts from the pyrolysis itself, because you're producing these, these volatile gases by heating up the wood. You're essentially driving out all the non-carbon constituents of that wood. Well, those non-carbon constituents of the wood, you can burn. So you can have a uh, self-sustaining production of biochar by taking these volatile gases, burning them, and then using that heat to get your 600 to 1200 degree Fahrenheit environment that you heat that wood up, okay? So it can be self-sustaining. Again, the byproducts are the gases and the biochar. And I think what the, uh, Probably the, the, the biggest question uh, would be, are there emissions? And the answer is definitely yes. They're, they're similar to combustion emissions, but there's different constituents. Uh, primarily polyaromatic hydrocarbons. You've got a lot more polyaromatic hydrocarbons from the pr production of biochar than you do this straight combustion of wood. You can have less particulate uh, from, pyro uh, from biochar production and pyrolysis, but that all depends on how you do it. So yes, there are air emissions. Um, 
and uh, they can be quite dangerous. The polyaromatic hydrocarbons include a lot of toxic air pollution, <coughs> pollutants. Um, and then the third question, can it be made legally? And the answer there is yes. There's, and I'm going to go over three, three ways you can do it legally. <clears throat> One, if, if, if you, if you, uh, you could do it for your own personal use on occasion, you could do it legally, but you have to get a legal burn permit and you've got to do that open burn legally. So, you, um, you can do it legally through a, a, a burn permit issued by ORCA. And uh, truth be told, I've actually done it myself. I've had to get a burn permit past years with uh, apple tree prunings. <clears throat> and so I conducted my legal burn on the ground. I waited till it was, uh, the coals were, were uh, all red and then I covered it with about four inches of dirt and by covering it with dirt I starved that combust that complete combustion of, of the coals I starved it of oxygen and it essentially cooled down and I was left with after a couple of days and I uncovered it there was sure enough there was biochar okay so you can't do it through a legal burn permit it's, it's got to be a legal burn, so you can't cause a nuisance, and uh, you got to comply with all the other requirements for a legal burn. So that's one way, and that's just for a single use. You, you can't be an ongoing thing, and it's got to be for your personal use. We've also had, the second way is we've also had what are referred to as demo, biochar demonstration projects, and like Evergreen State College inquired with us and Robert and I worked together and, and Fran on, on this and we concluded that that you could do a demonstration project with a legal burn permit and that uh, the burn has to be legal so you got to comply with all the nuisance regulations and, and all that you got to get your permit ahead of time that again is not ongoing that's just a single use for purposes of the demonstration. And uh, so that's the second way. So, so with that, with that second way, that's obviously got to be outside the UGA and uh, not during a burn ban and all that other good stuff or compliant with our open burning regulations. The third way is you can't get approval for a commercial production unit. And that has to go through a notice of construction, just like uh, other industrial sources and commercial sources need to get. We have not yet received a notice of construction for a biochar production facility. And we, we have had work with uh, Evergreen State College. They were thinking of um, they were thinking of starting a demonstration project where they would get a, a commercial large scale bio, uh, biomass gasification system that would produce biochar and electricity. Um, but that fizzled out because it was uh, because of economics, essentially. <clears throat> So today we have not yet received a notice of construction for such a facility, uh, but it can be done. And, and I think it can be uh, approved in, in, in the right uh, area and with the right air pollution controls. And essentially the air pollution controls are gonna be similar to that on a biomass combustion boiler like uh, <clears throat> we have it throughout our jurisdiction. So an electrostatic precipitator to take out the particulate and possibly a wet scrubber to take out uh, the acid gases like hydrogen chloride. And um, <clears throat> so this, I, I believe it, it, it can be approved. And uh, yeah, I look forward to the day that, 
that we actually get a uh, an application for one because it makes a lot of sense to me that that uh, biomass gets used and we reclaim the energy uh, instead of just burning it up. So that's uh, my quick report. And if, if you want to talk further, we could do that now or maybe after the board meeting on it. This is great. I, I'm fascinated by biochar. I think maybe I had mentioned it to Fran. I'm not sure, but uh, I'm glad I'm glad that the topic came up. And a question I have is down the line. I mean, I don't see any more scalable and cheaper sort of climate uh, change adaptive uh, measure that we can make. And I'm wondering if Orca might be in the position that we could try to incentivize, you know, logging to use, uh, you know, instead of slash piles do a covered burn and do a, you know, biochar, you know, pulp mill prices are $38 a ton right now and biochar prices are $600 a ton. I mean, it's, it's something that we could use in, in all of our jurisdictions as well. You know, if you use it in your, your counties or cities landscaping, you're going to be uh, filtering your stormwater. You know, we have a super toxic lake up here, Anderson Lake. We could make bags of biochar, throw it in the lake to soak up the nutrients and then give it to farmers and just, really uh, create a circular economy with what we is right now uh, uh, we struggle to 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 uh, accommodate in our waste stream or we have loggers burn up and add to our air pollution if we can do something constructive with it that fixes that carbon in there for a thousand years I'm wondering if that's something that we should, we might want to think about long term this is Randy Netherland uh you know, I went through all this for Mason County here recently and was amazed at the different benefits that came of, out of it, especially the, the extension of life for cattle by using the biochar. It was amazing. If we knew that Orca was, was supportive of something like this, I might uh, be able to talk to them about coming back. We came close out here and we looked at it, just wasn't sure. Uh, I don't know. I want to get it into our solid waste plan and build a biochar facility in Jefferson County. I think every county should have one. Yeah, well, no, they, they were bring, talking about building a big one here that could take you know, all of our logging stuff that we have, all of our that waste. If I could add here that, that uh, you know, right now there's a, there is an avenue for taking material out of the woods and burning it and reclaiming energy. And that's via, right now, McKinley Paper, some of our other mills located throughout the peninsula. So I think, you know, a biochar facility would be met with the same, uh, <clears throat> the same hurdles, namely, can you, can you get the material out of the woods to the unit uh, cost effectively? Um, it, it, so, when you say or is Orca supportive, I think you know. Bottom line, we're supportive of any technology that can meet the the uh, standing uh, air pollution laws in the state of Washington that are now 70, uh, 78.15 <laughs> RCW. Um, so you know that we're gonna we're gonna take a look at it by the books and treat them just as we would treat. Uh, a biomass combustion boiler. Uh, so it can be done. I think, I think the avenue, there's some great Canadian companies that uh, have uh, units that are already pre-designed. So, you know, you know, they're turnkey and you just put them at the site, you get your approvals and get, put them at the site and then boom, you can, you can create biochar, some electricity, and uh, yeah, so it can be done. It's got to meet the air pollution regulations, and uh, we'd be happy to work with any any company and you know go up front, have the pre pre application meetings to help help them guide them through the process. Hi, uh, Mark. You know. I was presented about biochar about a year and a half ago, and I, I was under the impression that Lewis County had a facility or, or trying to get one going. Do you know if that if that's true? Is that operational? 
You're asking about Lewis County if they've if it's operational. Is that what you said? I, mean, I know it's outside our region, but I'm just wondering. I mean, I, I I was presented with kind of a representative from a Lewis County operation that was extolling the benefits of. Virus. So let me let me see if I can because it's a little bit hard to hear. So you're saying that you someone came to you from Lewis County and you wondered if there's a facility in Lewis County that is actually utilizing biochar. Yeah, well, a commercial production uh, that that's been permitted through permitted. You know, the equivalent uh, authority. So we can check with Southwest Clean Air. That would be under their jurisdiction. We can check with them and see. Okay, I'm just curious. What happens to the larger woody debris that goes to Silver Spring? Uh, right now, <laughs> yeah, good question. I'm I'm working on their their application for an expansion uh, presently, but they get material already pre-shredded and pre-mixed, okay? But they do have larger woody debris, a stockpile of it, just in case the balance of the, the carbon nitrogen ratio of the stuff coming in is off kilter, then they could, they could rent a tub grinder and take that large woody debris and grind it. So they're overs, the, the large woody debris after they, they uh, uh, screen their finished compost goes back into the process. They just recycle that back in because that's a carbon deposit which for the compost, so it helps out their process. Got it, thank you. How, how much is a unit, like a commercial unit? Like give us a, is it millions, hundreds of thousands? I, I don't know, Jim. Okay, I'm just curious. As I think about how much woody debris goes just through our transfer stations at the county levels, it's it's a lot. So yeah. something, to, something to continue the conversation. Are there any other questions for Mark? Just to point out, it's not just woody debris, it's any organic matter, food waste, well, right. bunch of streams. Yeah, I was just thinking of the stuff that doesn't compost as easily, right? Like the bigger, right. bigger sizes, but okay, good point. Yeah. Jim, I, I would just add, uh, I, and I didn't know this topic was coming up, but uh, from my reading with my alma mater, WSU, I know they have a huge uh, program uh, called the Center for Sustaining Agriculture, and, excuse me, Agricultural and Natural Resources. And they have a huge biochar research program going on right now. So if you just Google WSU biochar, you'll get to that website and, and find some really good data. Cool. Thanks, Dan. Well, and I'll, you know, if, if there's, you know, without getting political, I'd be just kind of curious what the environmental groups think about bio, biochar as compared to the other options that are out there, if anybody has that information. Um, could send it to the board or chime in. That would be interesting. They love it. I mean, Good. it's uh, it's a drawdown technique. You know, it's one of the few positives. I, hi I highly recommend this book too. Burn using fire to cool the earth. Okay. That's great. Thanks, Greg. If I could just okay. ask you on on your final question there, in 20, uh, 2010, 2011, thereabouts, when we uh, when we had a several applications for biomass to energy plants, combustion that is, Evergreen had their proposal for this uh, biomass gasification project. That was about the time there was this no, no biomass burn organization. And there was a, quite a bit of public opposition to even uh, this project out at Evergreen. And the underlying reason is that you do need a heat source and you are combusting something to get that heat. Uh, so there was some opposition. It wasn't, it wasn't uh, opposition from environmental groups, actually, from a, from a climate change perspective. Got it. Well, I remember your in my one of my first meetings with you and Fran, sort of that presentation about, you know, what the pollutants are generated from leaving it to the compost in the forest versus burning it and, and everything in between. So if people haven't seen that, it's an interesting data to go on top of this. That, that study is on our website. Um, 
it was uh, there were 15 faiths they looked at i think the company was um dan you can probably direct you to it but we do have that study if anybody wants to read it cool Great. Yeah, that's still on the site. And uh, I'll note too that WSU Center, uh, they, they did a huge amount of research into how biochar helps uh, climate change and it's used as a means of carbon sequestration in the soil. So, Great. Okay, thanks for that uh, extra technical learning, Mark. It's really helpful for all of us. Appreciate it. Welcome. Okay, and so I think that it's a good transition uh, we'll move over to Odell and hear about our air quality in a time where it's one of the rare occasions where we can see the particulates. <laughs> Odell. Hey everyone, I'm going to share my screen with you. Wow, that's not a screen. There we go. Okay, uh, can you see that? Yes. yes. Okay. So the uh, August summary is actually pretty short um, and quick. So I'll just go through that and then I'll, uh, Fran asked me to present a little bit about um, forecasting current smoke conditions and where we're going from here. So I will then spend a couple minutes on that. So for August, um, we had almost complete data, 100% data at all of our sites. 31 good days, so you can see our even our maximums, we're still well within the good range. Um, we lost one day of data at the Raymond site. I think it was a data logger fault. I couldn't um, see a reason why we lost that day, but um, I'm assuming it was probably a good air quality day as well. So not much interesting there. Um, ozone, uh, typically we stop monitoring ozone in September, so um, I'm I'm guessing they're going to continue monitoring while we have wildfire smoke because wildfire smoke can amplify the ozone and because our temperatures this September have continued to stay above 80s and maybe even 90s. So um, we might expect to see ozone peaks this month as well. So you can see we have one peak that of ozone where the eight hour average went into the moderate, but this red line up here is the national ambient air quality standard and we didn't come close to that, so that's good. Um, and then I just threw in the Chica Peak ozone just to show you that it is really a wide spread regional pollutant. Um, it doesn't have the same diurnal variability. I've talked about that before, but you can kind of see where the background levels are very similar to what we see down here in Thurston County. So that's pretty much it for the air quality in August. You, um, as I mentioned last month, we stopped the, the Mason County sat study in June. So we have more than a year of that data and I am going to be working on writing that up and getting the final results of that study out. So then um, other monitoring news, uh, we have been going back to our sites. We've been able to get access to all of our sites now, which is great. So in August, we did, I did a, a Chica Peak site visit and Nick went out to Aberdeen to, to work on that one. A lot of my time has been spent finalizing our community toxics report. At some point, I will have a brief synopsis for you guys uh, when I finish that. So that's taking up, we're at 65 pages at this point, so I'll have to really condense it down <laughs> for you guys. Um, and then, as I said, the saturation study. I've also been helping out the macaw uh, this month with their um, air monitor. They've been having problems with that and, and ecology. I've been doing some work with them. And then lastly, um, Northwest AirQuest planning uh, so we have a meeting coming up October 1st. So I've been helping with that agenda and getting um, speakers from Washington and Idaho actually to uh, present on some of their research. I do want to, this EPA pilot project, I mentioned it last board meeting, and I think it's really pertinent now um, to share that with you. So this this will be a nice lead in to the smoke forecasting and our current conditions. So the site had not gone live last month during the board meeting, but this month it is and the, the address is fire.airnow.gov. And you can see, I'm gonna just scroll out. This is, it's the whole country. 
but when you log in, it, it'll ask if it can use your location and it will give you a blue dot. So this is the blue dot where my house is because this is on my computer. And it shows the circles. So over here, you'll see circles. Those are the um, state official air monitors. So those are the ones that we run. And when you click over here, uh, it'll give you the nearest monitors to you. So the circles, the Lacey College Street, then there's one down in Chehalis and Tacoma that is Puget Sound Clean Airs. The Chehalis one is run by Southwest Clean Air. So this is great. And then it'll give you the nearest sensors as well. And these are the purple air sensors. And EPA has put in an automatic algorithm to correct those purple air sensors. We've talked about how they overpredict. Well, EPA has an equation. So the data on this site are already corrected to be consistent. And so when you look at the map, you can see that the sensors and the official monitors, they're actually doing a pretty good job and they generally agree. And you can see where those sensors are in our area. They also have current active fires on here. So satellite fires that are sensed and it'll tell you when you click over here um, that there is the nearest satellite fire detection in my house is 12 miles away to the southwest. I think that's the one down on Bordeaux uh, that had some people evacuated near Mima Mounds yesterday. And then it says there's eight fires within 150 mile radius. So this is a great site for just kind of a all-in-one shopping. Um, and then a smoke plume has been detected in your area. So I'm going to scroll out so you can see that smoke plume. So this gray outline is where they uh, use models to map out the smoke plume. And this is updated pretty frequently. So this is all real-time data. I think it's updated once every hour. One last thing um, I'm going to mention here for uh, reasons that I cannot tell you and ecology can't tell me, the Shelton air monitor is only reporting the air quality data maybe once every four or five hours. All the data is there when it does report, but instead of giving us an hourly update, it, it's skipping its updates. And so when it does that, this map, this, the circle for Shelton will turn gray. I want to just mention we do have a purple air sensor at the Shelton site. Still, we left one up and that one's co-located with our sensor. And if you scroll in enough, you can see it. Ah, where'd it go? There you go. So you can see that those two are separated a little bit. So if you really need to get the up-to-date information on Shelton and our air monitor hasn't reported, you can still get the data from this purple air monitor. And then one last thing on this site, if you click on any one of these, a sensor or an air monitor, and you just click on it, it brings up the last several days of air quality. And you can look at AQI or you can look at concentration. So that is my brief lesson on how to use the Air Now site. And if you guys have any questions. I do. Um, yes. Odell, so um, I know that there was like a fire on around exit 108 in Lacey. With, but I don't know, I mean, it's like two acres and I assume it was put out. Would that That's have been probably captured? too small. Okay. That, that would probably be too small to be cut. So these are fires that are detected by satellites. So typically they've got to be pretty big. Um, and so you see, this is that one up by Bonnie Lake uh, in in Puyallup, and then this is the one down off of Bordeaux Road and Mimer Road. So anything, those are pretty good size fires and they're still showing up as pretty small. Um, but okay. they don't really have any information on this site. If you wanted information on the fires themselves, you'd have to go to the DNR or NC Web. Okay, so the, any other questions on that site? Okay. Cool, so. thank you. Okay, so then the last um, thing, Fran, so I wanted to just kind of quickly go through um, the forecasting for the smoke and then where we're going from, from here. So I'm starting on, on Sunday. I was in communication with Dan and Fran, and Dan might talk a little bit more about this because he's the one that pushes this. Inf I push the information out to Dan and Fran. Dan then pushes it out to the public. He packages my information in a way that everyone can 
So this is a satellite image of wildfires in the Pacific Northwest on Sunday, September 6th. And you can see some pretty incredible smoke plumes coming out of California, and this one um, coming out of Central Oregon. On Sunday, I was concerned because I knew Monday that we were gonna get a wind storm and that they were gonna switch to easterly. And my concern was this fire right here, this is the Evans Canyon fire. And then this one up here hadn't been named yet. Um, but I did see it on the satellite image and was like, I wonder what that fire is. So I saw that there was this smoke over here in Eastern Washington and I was concerned and Dan was, you know, we were concerned because we knew that winds were going to switch. So then this is the next day. This is Labor Day on uh, at 3 p.m. And I went to check and this is after the winds have switched. So now you can see these plumes are starting to rotate around coming over this way. And these fires right here again, hadn't popped up on any of the maps, but I could see them on the satellite. And these are brand new fires that I hadn't accounted for when I was doing the forecasting. And so Dan and I looked at those and thought, well, that, that could be a problem. And then I grabbed another satellite image two hours later. And they had, I mean, this was really surprising to me. I was like, well, those have just blown up in the last two hours and we are definitely getting a lot of smoke. And then this is that wall of smoke right here that moved through the area at about 8 p.m. down here. I think for you guys up north in Port Townsend and Port Angeles, it was more like three o'clock in the morning, but it took, that's how long it takes to move. So the winds were kind of pushing it up this way. So one of the challenges that we have in forecasting is we don't know where the fires are going to pop up and we don't know how smoky they're going to be and we don't know when they're going to be put out. And, you know, you remember I was initially very worried about that Evans Canyon fire. Well, it's almost disappeared from the map. I don't even see any smoke from it, but these new ones clearly have popped up. So this was um, yesterday morning at 10 a.m. And now we see that Oregon is, and I'm sure you've all seen on the news, now Oregon has just completely entirely caught on fire. So we have this huge pool of smoke sitting out over the Pacific and sitting to the south of us. This is a new fire too that has just popped up in Washington state. This is the um, oh, hollow, big hollow fire down south of us. I think it's at about six to 10,000 acres. And then these fires up here just kind of pushed north and we didn't see a lot uh, of smoke continuing to come over because of northerly winds. And so what is sitting over us yesterday and today is just this reservoir of smoke that came over. And the winds aren't very strong and it's not really moving around very much. So this is at 10 a.m. and then as the wind switched to northerly, it kind of just sloshed this smoke down. And so the whole area is kind of just sitting at moderate to unhealthy for sensitive groups. Um, it's not really moving anywhere. So where we go from here, this is the satellite image from this morning at 8 a.m. Um, again, there's this huge pool of smoke sitting over here in eastern Washington. We are, here's what our air quality smoke um, column looked like for this morning. So we saw some clearing up here in Port Angeles and Chica Peak area. But we expect that these, um, this smoke is going to continue to push over that area and get worse throughout the day today um, and probably get worse tomorrow. So we can see, expect to see orange and red sites this e afternoon and tomorrow. Um, the real concern that we have, and there is a smoke coordination call that I'm on tomorrow, so we'll see how that plays out. But the real concern is this. So Thursday I mentioned, um, or maybe I didn't mention, the winds are going to switch to southerly and westerly, which is really just going to bring all of this right up into our neighborhood. And that's, that's a really bad scenario for us. Um, so I, I wish I had better news for all of you, but it looks like at least through the weekend and into Monday, uh, it's not great and it's just going to get worse. And I, I wish that that was not the case, but even if all the fires were put out today, this is a huge amount of smoke um, just already sitting there in the atmosphere that will come through. Are we so. assuming that it's going to be um, not just
sensitive, to, uh, not just uh, impactful to sensitive groups, but also into the bad for everyone? Yes. Okay. So, um, so here, and I just wanted, this is a, a, a large pulled out version just so you can see the extent of that smoke and how far out into the Pacific that goes. So even if the winds switch and we get westerlies, it's, it's just gonna push all this stuff back in. Um, and also these are just, this is crazy, crazy. So um, yeah, I, I can show you the current map, um, the Air Now map, that's the one. So this is Oregon right now. And these purple maps are not just unhealthy for everyone, but very unhealthy. So as this plume shifts and moves to the north and to the, to the east over us, I expect we'll get red and purple air monitors as well. And, and that starts Thursday evening and, and that could really be Friday. The message that we, you know, we send out information about air quality, but we ask but in our in all the messages Dan sends out, we say that you know we're not we don't we're not a health department. We don't give out medical information. We encourage people to call their local health departments to get because people are always saying, "What should I do? You know, should I stay inside? What should I do?" And we again, we're not medical. We can give data, but we want them to contact their health departments. That's important. Do we send a, a memo to those health district or health departments in our region and let them know this is coming, or do they just? See it on the weather forecast. Adele, are they on the call? Um, can you repeat that? I was distracted by trying to oh. get my Zoom screen back. <laughs> there I, I it is. Okay. Do, do Sorry, we communicate formally to the health departments and let them know this is coming, or do they have to watch it on Como? Jim, I know uh, most of our county health departments are on our email alerts, so they get that along with the media. Uh, so we've put out an alert already that this is coming? Pardon? Did we put out an alert already that this We've done the two coming? or three alerts over the past few days, yeah. Over the weekend, as Odell said, we, Fran, Odell, and I all worked uh, Saturday, Sunday, Monday watching this and, and sending out uh, email alerts and, and social media blasts and website posts. Uh, so we, we've been trying to stay on top of it. Uh, and as Odell said, things shift. And I mean, the, the good news, bad news scenario uh, with shifting winds, when you go from a southwest wind to a, to a northeast wind like they did uh, this week, it was great. It, it essentially put out the Evans Creek fire because it pushed the fire back into the already burned areas. The bad news is that uh, takes that plume of smoke that's in the atmosphere and pushes it right back at us. So it, it as and that's what we're seeing now. As Odell mentioned, we've got the plume of smoke that avoided us, drifted out over the Pacific. That's great. Our air avoided all of that Oregon smoke. Now that Oregon smoke is going to push right back into us. And then we have some local fires. We've got a fire down by Capitol Forest. We've got we've got Sumner and Bonnie Lake area. So locally, we've got we've got fires. And so what we're trying to do is send out information as we know it, um, because again, this is not the scenario that Odell talked about is not one that we anticipated. So we're, again, we're trying to be very careful about what we send out when we send it out. So there'll be another message that goes out today. And, and the other thing that even on the weather um, app, it shows, it talks about, they say, you know, go to for, for information about air quality, they direct um, people to Puget Sound, to us, to, you know, to the, to the right sources. So. Um, Dan's done a really good job of getting to the media and, and having them understand where they need to go to get good information. Yeah. And so let me, can I clarify then, there will be an alert today that will go out that will talk about that shift Odell's talking about for tomorrow? Yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll okay. publish something okay. today as well as tomorrow and, and probably every day through the rest of this Thank week. You. Just again, this is such a, a dynamic week. It's It's something we haven't seen in the past where Again, Sunday we were watching the, the Evans Creek Canyon fire, thinking, well, we're going to dodge that bullet because the winds are going to be northeast to north northeast. And so that's going to push it through Snoqualmie or through White Pass and south of us and make it a southwest clean air problem. 
we did not anticipate a, a OMAC area fire, the Cold Creek Canyon fire, going from basically a campfire to 300,000 acres in 12 hours. And so that's a huge fire that, that unprecedented growth and, and expansion, so. Yeah, that, yeah the, that one was interesting. That the, I don't know if you, people saw the governor's post yesterday that we had one day of fire acreage that was bigger than uh, 12 of the 18 last season. Yeah. So it's pretty significant, so good information. Jim, Go, go ahead, Joan. Sorry, I'm for some reason I'm hogging the mic. No, no, it's okay. It's it's important. Um, I I just wondered how um, we add to the warnings or what what we say when this is combined with two ninety plus days in temperature. Um, you know, there's some people just suffering because of heat. Will be suffering because of the heat. And then we have talked, um, Joan. We've talked about that in the past, and and. Dan and I, I mean, so there are, what is the Northwest or the National Weather Service does have a list of um, cool shelters, I guess you would call them. So for people that don't have AC, uh, there are, you know, libraries, malls, there are places where people can go at least during the day at the heat of the day to make sure they're not, and, and you know, those places are expecting those people to come in. So uh, Dan and I can work with, um, and then the health department as well on on getting that message out as well. But yeah, it is. It's really. It's always a, a, a interesting, difficult line to walk where you can't tell people, you know, close your house up, don't open any of your windows. And if it's ninety five degrees and they don't have air conditioning, that can be a health problem as well. That can be a real health problem. So um, plus, well, we, we do I have guess a there is the problem of. Um, the pandemic on top of that so a number of these places would they still open it up for like the libraries when they are closed down i hadn't that you're right i that is another issue and i don't know if matt so yeah there the, we have a lot of challenges right now and um as we can give out the information on the air quality we don't typically give out health advice that we leave that up to the health department and to to people to speak with their medical practitioners um yeah, and the, the, the cooling shelters falls to the, the local health departments and the local government agencies. Uh, again, we're not a health department. The saving grace for this event uh, that I see is it's occurring in September instead of early August. So we have overnight temperatures dropping into the 50s. So we don't, even though we're going to see temperatures for a couple days going into the 90s here, overnight that's dropping into the 50s. So we've got great cooling. Uh, that also means a, a great temperature differential from from over a 12-hour period from overnight to midday. So we see good thermal lift. So right now, for instance, at 8 o'clock this morning, there was a good layer of smoke around my house here uh, in North Thurston County. Right now, it's crystal clear, and, and there's not a, a whiff of smoke because we have good thermal lift and very little base wind. So that the air is moving upward in a in a thermal lift uh, the downside is overnight that cooling air pulls that back down to ground level so right now i have every window in the house open and we can cool off the house uh, by late afternoon when it's hot we can close the house up and and avoid the smoke and the heat so again we're it's not the best situation but at least it's occurring in september when we do have cool overnight temperatures and that thermal transition creates some incredible lift that can help us periodically clear out some air. And yesterday, Dan and I participated um, with the City of Olympia and Thurston County on the Hazardous Weather Task Force, and they asked us to participate. And they were talking about focusing on the homeless uh, folks and how to handle this whole situation. And they were actually the issue about COVID-19 and um, you know opening up churches or places where homeless could go um, for air quality to be to stay cool um, and they were saying that they actually were going to still comply with you know social distancing etc they're providing masks and so at least for that group of people they were saying no they were not going to change the standards um, you know and that, that they would keep people they would open up facilities and they're looking at trying to find volunteers or looking at churches and schools that aren't open to find a variety of facilities where people can go 
um, to to actually be safe and you know try to stay cool and stay out of the the poor air quality. So and and again, not burn at the camps, you know, in the homeless camps. That was the other thing that, that there was a discussion about. So Dan and I can will continue to participate with those folks um, as needed. And that was just their oh. idea. So quick question, is there a way to save the chat for the uh, links? It doesn't seem to be on this particular one. So wait, I'm sorry, Cynthia, I didn't hear what you said. Well, there's a couple of links in the chat. Um, oh. Debbie, maybe you could grab those and send them out to the board afterwards so people have them, uh, both the news and information site. And then Dan just shared the, the WSU uh, biochar site. Right. Yes. And we can send out the um, the air now the information too. Right. Yeah. If you if you want them right away though, click on it. It'll open your browser, and then you can look at it. We can know what's the meaning. We'll right. send an email with that information out today. Joan, did you get your question answered? Yeah, I have it. Okay. It more than answered off in another direction. I my part of my question was just when you have temperatures like this, and you have. Um, you know, fires and the smoke out there. I was just wondering how, you know, temperature impacted uh, the movement of like, say that, that smoke back, back in, back over, uh, because we do have a lot of people in, in this area, uh, families and elderly people who do not have air conditioning. So um, I just wondered the combination. We have, we have quite a combination here for a few days. But and it, uh, and it can be a problem. I, I basic I basically got it uh, answered, and I and I uh, I appreciate it. Okay, yeah, I, I would just reiterate it can be a problem, but it, again, I'm I'm not a, a formally trained meteorologist, but I've done a lot of self training and and uh, in instruction classes at at universities uh, because I was a paraglider pilot, and so I'm looking at lifting air. And right now, the situation is perfect for the air to move from ground level up to several thousand feet in the atmosphere because of the temperature differentials and the lift index. So you get that thermal lift and that, when the air lifts, anything in the air lifts with it. So a lot of the smoke, like I said, that had a, a heavy plume around my house this morning at sunrise and now it's crystal clear and beautiful. So, but, it, but it's still going to be 90 something this afternoon. Right. And that, yeah. and that, but that, that heating is what lift creates that thermal lift because yeah. of the change from the morning temperature to that. So that again, that then the downside is as the temperature cools after sunset, all of that smoke settles mm -hmm. back down to the ground level at, after dark. So uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't know if our monitors are showing that, but I would sig suspect that we'll see some fluctuation during daylight hours along those lines but uh, that may not be the case directly on our monitors but it is in localized meteorological situations so the other thing i i wanted to point out is uh people are using the the resources were of our links to the health department unfortunately i noticed yesterday the state department of health's uh, wildfire pages were uh, shut down by server overload. Uh, so pe so many people are going to those uh, or to that site for information that it overloaded their server and they were down for a, an hour or two. Well, thanks for for all that. I I appreciate it. And uh, um, Jim, thanks for getting back to me. I I just know lots of people from way back when when I was um, living with my mom those years, elderly folks, and they. They have a tendency to call call me, call their friends, you know, what to do and all those kinds of things. And this is a little panicky for, for, for a lot of them. So um, I, I appreciate the conversation. And I told them, get up a little earlier, open up your windows, leave them open till about, you know, 9 or 10 or 11 o'clock and just close them and turn your fans on. So I became the health department, so don't worry that you're not getting out <laughs> information i am <laughs> the, uh, Odell. the other added piece right now is with COVID 19 and, and if you have poor air quality and and people you know are sick um there's the potential that they could get sicker so we have another layer this year that we don't have at other times too because of COVID. yeah you're right and people are worried so as we transition odell can you tell us again when you expect the wind to change 
Thursday afternoon. Okay. So tomorrow afternoon, hold on, I can tell you exactly when we will see that shift. It but again, will occur. That just means we're going to get Oregon smoke instead of Washington smoke. Around well, just four by the map, it's a lot more. That's why I'm concerned. Right. Yeah. So between 4 and 5 p.m. Okay. Thank you very much. Anything else from your report, Odell, or are we done? I don't have anything. Okay. Well, and that's a good transition to Dan. Uh, Dan, uh, oh, actually, let me just say thank you to all the staff for the extra hours you're putting in to keep us safe. So I know this is a, a, a high profile time for you right now. So thank you for that. Thank, Dan, you're welcome, Jim, you're welcome. But I will confess, and even talking to some of the ecology people, we're nerds. This is what we do. We would do it even if we weren't working. We would be on our computers looking right at on. this stuff. Right on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Probably for more pay in a private company, right? <laughs> We're used to working <laughs> holidays around here. It's, if, it's, right. if it's not wildfire smoke during Labor Day weekend, it's uh, inversions during Thanksgiving and Christmas. So. Right. <laughs> um, so, Dan, anything else on education and outreach? Uh, not a lot. Uh, this was the past few weeks we've been looking at this. Uh, I've done a lot of background stuff that you won't notice, hopefully, on our website. I will note, uh, to go back to our earlier conversation on the RCW change, uh, Fran mentioned the tracking down the, the Clean Air Act on, on the legislative pages is difficult, but we do have links now on our site uh, directly to 78.15 instead of 70.94. So uh, if you're having trouble finding the new Clean Air Act uh, links, uh, just go to orca.org and go to the about regulations and you'll find it immediately. Other than that, our wood stove program is, is uh, pun intended, getting hot. Uh, I signed six new agreements uh, the past or just this week uh, people are, are getting eager to avoid their wood stoves for the coming heating season a uh, couple are saying well it's going to be hot maybe I, it's time to, to move to a ductless heat pump and have some cooling during the summer since the summer seems to be running into late september now so uh, people are, are taking advantage of that in all three of the eligible counties and uh, for Greg, I did have an unfortunate conversation with a fellow that was in Port Townsend and really wanted to participate today. And I had to explain that the state won't let us uh, give him money, but I kept his name and number and uh, may use him as a witness for our defense when we come up and ask for expansion of the program during the next budget cycle. Let me know if you need more people. <laughs> we'll be bringing a budget amendment to you in September. Uh, October to add thirty five thousand dollars to our budget for the wood stove program. Great. Questions for Dan. Okay, thank you, Dan. Thank you, Odell. If I forgot to say that, I think I might have transitioned. Uh, okay, Lynn. Uh, any finance and administrative updates? Well, not too much. One was the budget amendment that we'll be bringing forward to the board. We don't need it now, but we may need it in the very near future. And that's a $35,000 addition to the wood smoke reduction. And uh, we'll do a, a budget update at our October meeting that will follow the finance committee meeting that will happen next month prior to our board meeting. And I believe that consists of Jim and Cynthia and Greg and- Randy. And oh, Ty. Okay, yes, board. So, <laughs> and we'll discuss uh, where we are. You're welcome to join us, Greg. <laughs> I don't have to get up earlier to come meet you, so I'd be happy to. <laughs> well, your, your input is valuable, so jump on board there, Greg. <laughs> so, uh, but, you know, a couple months into the year, we're doing fine on the revenue side, and we're, we're, we're uh, keeping our expenditures where they should be lower than normal, lower than average. So we're definitely following suit there. And 
for our building and tenants, there's really no changes to report there. Tenant activity is the same. Rents are paid. We still have the one vacancy upstairs and it's still being advertised on Craigslist. We haven't really gotten any recent activity, which is okay. I'm upstairs, so that's okay. <laughs> and yeah, I keep in regular communication with the tenants, doing some courtesy reminders, you know, masks are required, et cetera, that we're not required to uh, follow their uh, behavior. We, we look and we listen and we observe. And again, we send courtesy reminders just reminding them what they should be doing and providing them some courtesy links to health and CDC. I've already gotten some responses back that some of our tenants have actually incorporated parts of that into their requirements with their clients and customers that they're seeing. So that's, that was a nice feedback. I was glad to hear that. And, you know, we've had some minor maintenance issues occur in our building. We're in the process of scheduling some carpet cleaning, which we regularly do on a year, year and a half basis for the common areas. We did have some um, active bees nest recently removed, free, which is so nice that they're gone. There was one that was quite active and it was right at the, the south west corner of her building where most of us have to access and walk by to enter the building and leave the building. So it was nice to see those little guys um, on their new life. For you know wellness again I continue to keep staff informed. I just recently emailed a really nice resource guide on assisting them in the remote working environments, ergonomics, etc. How to better more efficiently communicate with one another in the remote environment that so many of them are conducting right now. The EAP again resources, courtesy reminders there for our employees. So, uh, you know, but other than that, budget is good, working on year end stuff. I'll be sending hopefully next month my SAO, State Auditor's Office, year end reports, usually following that submission to the SAO. It usually takes them about a month to schedule us for the two year audit. Again, that will likely occur near the end of this year. SAO has actually been conducting all of their audits remotely. So this will be, this will be an eye opener because there's so much sensitivity, sensitive information, confidential. So I guess we'll work with it and we'll see what happens during this. We are so close to them. so. Who knows? We'll, we'll see what changes are um, that will be coming into play there. And I'll be working with Debbie on the, you know, public records request, the sensitive confidential information, et cetera, and likely with our attorney's office too. So other than that, things are, are moving. You know, it seems like things are busier, but I, I don't know. I have no problem keeping a regular rhythm going here. No problem. Any questions from y'all? All right, well, stay safe. Thank you, Lynn. Okay, Fran. Okay, so I talked about the hazardous weather task force that Dan and I participated in. I was going to mention that. Um, and we really appreciate, you know, Odell's really staying on top of the air quality. It's just, it's a really tough situation. And as she indicated, you know, she and Dan and I worked over the weekend. And it's true, it always happens on holiday weekends. It's just something, I don't know. Um, Lynn's been great about sending out wellness information, you know, with half our staff or more than half our staff working remotely. Um, it's really important to keep connected with them. Um, and so we have our staff meetings once a month and we talk about um, what they're doing. Um, and, um, you know, what they're doing for fun kinds of things as well as work because they need, you know, and I've said, we know folks have to stay productive. That's really critical. Um, you know, certainly it's not as effective to be working in this kind of manner, but people are doing a good job. Um, they're getting their work done. Um, but I know that, you know, it'd be better if we could have folks here. And I don't expect folks to be back in the office until sometime next year. Um, I, you know, again, you you hear all about the vaccine. Um, we're, we're encouraging folks to get flu shots because again, of the similarity between flu symptoms and COVID symptoms. Um, 
and I'm hoping that folks will get the vaccine once it's available and it's going to be in a tiered manner so that first responders and certain folks with underlying conditions, et cetera, will get it first. Um, and I'm hoping that what they're saying about they're following the science is actually going to be the case because I don't want people to be reticent and I want them to feel comfortable, just like I want to feel comfortable <clears throat> about getting a vaccine that's been truly tested. So that's something that we're still looking at. Um, so again, staff are working as hard as they can. Um, engineers are working, are all working remotely except for Mark. Um, for compliance, we've got half of them working remotely and half of them, um, two, I've got two um, folks here. And you know, Mike who's down in Pacific County works between his home and his office. He's got a little cubicle or a little like room, self-contained room in the county, which is great. Um, so, you know, we try to stay connected with staff. That's important um, that, that people, that we stay in connection, that they still feel part of the organization. Um, and just one more note, Mike, Mike Throckmorton, our other attorney, is not on the call today because he just, he and his wife just had twin boys about, what, a week ago, I think. They now have four boys. Um, so everything went well. The boys, the twins were big. And so I'm assuming they're already home from the hospital. They delivered at St. Joe's in Tacoma because of the NICU unit there, but they were both six pounders. So I think they're fine in their home. So, so we won't see Mike for probably a month um, with four little kids. He's got his hands full, he and his wife. So um, I think that's pretty much it. Um, we have our meeting in October. And, and as Jim said, we don't meet in November, but we will meet in December. Um, so I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Graham, are we able to help employees accommodate with equipment at home? Like if they need monitors or chairs or desks to actually be comfortable and, and productive, is that something that we've been able to help with? We haven't had to do any of that. You know, laptop would be the only thing that we've really needed to do. Um, you know, some of the, like for instance, um, Mike has a debt, bought a, we had a, and Mike has a, in his office here, had a situation where you could move the, you know, the station to be sitting and standing. He took that. So that's okay, not cool. there anymore. Um, so, so if they're at home, they can take a bunch of their workstation home. Yeah, they, they can okay. take a portion of, their, portion of their workstation home with them, yeah. Great, okay, thank you. And then I also wanted to just check in on OPM. I think all of us do this in another role. So we're, we're good through the 1st of October and then we expect an extension probably. Yes. First of October, 1st of October, and um, the governor had requested the the legislative leadership to oppress, to approve it through November 1st, so that signals a, a yet another extension is likely to come. The, the legislative leadership wanted to go one month at a time. Okay. And do you expect or have you heard any inklings of a, a new OPMA in the legislature in January that allows for remote meetings permanently, or, or are we going to do a month at a time? Anything. Okay. Great. Okay. Anything else for Fran? Anything for the order? I have one thing for the good of the order. Okay. So I'm Jeff and then Ty. Hopefully this, this, this works. I just wanted to share pictures, ah. <laughs> pictures of Michael's <laughs> twins. Cute. So that man needs more than a month. <laughs> uh, he, he's going to be gone for a month, but his wife um, uh, uh, is is home as well, and she's recovering from a. Uh, it's a quite quite the process. So, right. just wanted to share that for everybody. Cute, hey, Jeff. That's a great way to 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 close out. Ty. Well, I just wanted to note. I it was noted by email that I'm probably missing the October meeting. What wasn't on my calendar was a finance committee meeting. So. I'm probably missing that as well. Um, just FYI, because I've got we've got budget all day that day, and I don't think it's. Gonna and be and Ty, we understand that there'll be the, that um, Hutch, who's your yeah, alternate, will team. not be there also because it's all all three commissioners. Right. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So Hopefully Cynthia and and Randy and I'll do finance and and Greg or anyone if you want to join us, feel free. So as long as we don't have five. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Okay. Anything else for the good of the order? Okay, we're adjourned, everyone. Stay safe. Stay inside. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Good to see y'all.